Hey guys, um, I'm making this video with the hope that it'll help someone uh, who has this same problem someday. Um, I know when I ran into this, I would have uh, really appreciated a video like this. So uh, hopefully, some of you, someone in, out there, finds this valuable. Um, so this summer, I bought a uh, used uh, Deer uh, 310SJ backhoe. I've uh, been using it kind of throughout the summer and fall. It's a pretty low hour machine, 3,300 hours or so, pretty tight and really been working good for me. Um, my only issue I've been having with it um, this summer is that um, kind of after I was digging with the backhoe for um, maybe more than an hour or an hour and a half, kind of once the um, kind of swing frame joints kind of heated up, um, I started getting noise in the swing function, you know, uh, pin bushing squeal uh, after the grease kind of thinned out and warmed up. Uh, after this would happen, it it didn't matter how much fresh fresh grease you'd pumped into that joint, it would just squeal like nobody's business, um, and it would keep getting worse as it got hotter and hotter. Um, at first, I thought, you know, maybe I wasn't using the right grease. Um, I read somewhere that um, maybe these swing frame joints are more highly loaded than most. Um, normally, I run like uh, the Lucas Red and Tacky grease on all of my uh, other heavy equipment with good luck, but I thought maybe I wasn't using the right grease. Um, Deer recommends this um, this lithium with, uh, with Molly in it uh, for... For pin joints, I this is a really nice grease. Um, I did try it though, and basically had uh, no improvement. Uh, same thing, maybe after an hour or so, the swing would start making noise again. Um, the next thing I did was um, I well, first of all, to figure out which joint it was that was making the noise, um, I kind of looked out the back window while it was making noise and was really critically looking at, you know, okay, what what joint is moving when I'm hearing the noise? And I could see enough play in my swing cylinder rod ends that I could hear the noise even before I could see them engaging, like just really moving the swing really slowly, I could still hear the noise. So I knew it was the kind of this main uh, rear frame to um, swing frame joint that was the one making the noise. So I thought I should take a look at the pins to see what's going on. Um, to get the pins out, um, what I did was um, initially there was just, you know, st stretch the backhoe out kind of to full reach um, in a safe position like that um, and, you know, de-energize the, um, the controls, you know, kind of roll the functions with the, func with the backhoe settled, kind of take all the pressure off and push the pins out. Sometimes I had to um, kind of fiddle with how much boom down pressure I was applying to kind of get the loading just right to push the pin out. Um, I used, I just used kind of a regular uh, uh, piece of one and a half inch pipe on my floor jack. So I just set this, set this on my floor jack and kind of pushed up on the pins to push them up out of there. Um, if yours are really uh, seized up or um, kind of in the static bores, there's a lot of corrosion. You know, you might want to soak it with a penetrant like croil or seafoam deep creep or something, you know, for a few days to kind of get those freed up a little first. Mine actually pushed right out. There was grease in the static part of the bore also. So um, they did push out pretty easy. And when I did get the old pins out and looked at them, um, I just saw pretty heavy wear. Um, this is the back side of the pin that uh, kind of faces um, forward on the machine. So this would be taking all the load from kind of the moment to the, you know, the back hole uh, pulling on it. You can also kind of see kind of the grease groove um, versus the contact area there kind of worn out um, and a lot of kind of ad adhesive wear or galling going on. So what I did first was, you know, cross my fingers and maybe I could just put in new pins and the issue would go away. I bought two new pins from Deer from my local dealer and um, put those in and uh, I would say the issue was almost the, about the same. Maybe I could run a few minutes longer but 
when they would start making noise, um, it was the same thing. New grease wouldn't do anything. Um, and you can see that, you know, even the brand new pins here were starting to um, gall already. Um, so it was at this point that I uh, kind of grudgingly decided there's, there's really no other fix for this as to um, replace the bushings. Um, if you guys are like me, um, this is a pretty big job, um, you know, other than say uh, replacing an engine or transmission, replacing bushings is, uh, it's pretty difficult for the DIYer. So um, what I did kind of approaching this uh, problem, first, uh, first of all, you got to separate the backhoe off the machine to get in there. Um, I just, I have a farm shop, I kind of used what I had. If you have an overhead bridge crane, this would be really the proper way to do it. But um, I went to full reach and put the bucket on a pallet jack and I put my uh, 10 ton floor jack under the kind of the boom foot there um, to support it. Um, you know, de depressurized everything with the backhoe controls, you know, read your manual for how to do that. And then disconnected all my plumbing, capped it off. Um, and uh, you know, once all the plumbing was disconnected, I knocked the rest of my pins out either with a, a dead blow hammer or kind of the jack method I talked about before and uh, rolled it back. Um, be prepared for um, many hours of wiping and cleaning messy grease off everything. This probably took me three or four hours to kind of get everything cleaned up like you see here. There's just grease everywhere and these joints on an old machine that's, that's really never had this done. Um, once you've got the backhoe off like this, you can kind of, you have much better access to everything. For me, I would have had to remove my backhoe valve to get that, um, the swing cylinder trunnion casting up high enough to pull my swing cylinders off. So I left them in place and kind of, um, you know, they do move once you, uh, uh, you know, have everything disconnected, you can kind of push them out of the way. I figured it'd be less work, um, and I could probably, I decided I could work around them. Uh, it, when when you guys are work, if you don't take your swing cylinders off, make sure you kind of cover them up if you're doing any welding or hammering on things. Make sure you're protecting those rods as you're swinging hammers and doing heavy work around them. You don't want to, um, you know, damage your chrome. Um, but anyway, to get the bushings out, uh, the old bushings, what I did was um, got the old ones over here or one old one, um, I I welded uh, kind of these like axial uh, just strips with my wig, MIG welder and uh, let it cool down and then I was able to just knock it out. I used an OTC uh, kind of step plate adapter with the shoulder in it to kind of set you know right on top of the of the bushing and kind of with the shoulder helps keep it located and then I just whacked it with a, a two pound uh, dead blow hammer and uh, that worked pretty good. They, they didn't just fall out, but uh, I, they, it, hitting it with a hammer made steady progress and they did come out. Um, the deer manual recommends um, the vertical strips like this. I think this is probably really what you want because you want the bushing to um, kind of shrink radially. Um, I saw some videos where guys were kind of welding like around the inner circumference here all the way around, I think, which would tend to shrink the bushing axially, but I think either method works. This is what the manual did and, and it worked, uh, but whatever your preference is there. Um, so that's how you get the old ones out. And probably if you guys are watching this video, the big question you have is how the heck am I going to get these new bushings in here? So. Um, you can calculate um, how much press force it's going to take to get them in. Um, there's a lot of nice uh, online calculators, engineering calculators, where you can um, measure your bore um, ID and measure your and then measure your bushing OD, and uh, you know put your boss um, you know OD on, and uh, it'll it'll calculate uh, how much press force you're going to need to push push the bushing in. Um, in uh, in my case, it was it was close to 20 tons, um, and my interference fit was uh, pretty high, like around 0.3 millimeters or so. Um, that's a good first step to kind of figure out how much force 
and shrinkage that you guys think you're going to need to get that bushing in there so you kind of know how to approach it. Um, what I had read about before I got into this job as kind of the two most popular ways of getting the new ones in there is to um, use liquid nitrogen or to um, use a, um, a hollow bore cylinder um, to pull the bushings in. Um, there, there aren't many videos out there um, kind of showing how to do this with liquid nitrogen. So this is kind of one of the main reasons I wanted to make this video for you guys. Um, so to start with, to, to figure out if it's going to work for you or not, Again, there are there's some some other nice online calculators where you can enter your um, like you can select you can just say this is a piece of pipe and you can enter your pipe OD your pipe ID and then your temperature differential. In my case, this was um, 90 millimeters OD and 74 ID millimeters. And uh, liquid nitrogen. Um, is about uh, I think it was minus 320 F um, for its its core temperature. Um, you can add your uh, shop ambient on top of that. You know 50 60 degrees F. Uh, you know to give you a total temp delta of um, you know 370 to 380 uh, degrees F. That would be. Um, and you type all that in. And in my case, um, it ended up saying that my bushing would shrink 0.2 millimeters on the OD. Um, like I mentioned before, though, my interference was uh, with my measurements on the bore were 0.3. So I still was going to have a light interference fit there, even with a cold bushing. So I wasn't sure if this was going to work. Um, and what happened to me in my case was um, I pulled the bushings out of the liquid nitrogen. I dropped them in. They did not drop in the bore. Um, I had a, my step plate adapter and a hammer, and I started tapping on them. Uh, they made it in maybe a quarter of the way, and then it was just a dead stop. I was just totally hosed. Um, I couldn't go any further. Um, I'll tell you kind of what happens next here, but um, getting back to liquid nitrogen, for, for those of you trying to learn more about this, um, there is a... Now, there's a video out there from that uh, uh, that guy in Australia, uh, that uh, cutting edge engineering. He's got a nice video on this too. Um, I kind of wanted to make this uh, for maybe the DIYer Americans to kind of get a feel for what needs to happen here. But to get a hold of this stuff, if you guys do do the math and you calculate that liquid nitrogen is enough of a shrink that you can just drop it in, I, I would not recommend doing this process if... Um, you're still going to have an interference fit after the shrinkage. I, I would say if you've got more than, if you've got any interference left at, with the nitrogen, I would say don't bother with the nitrogen. You're probably wasting your money. Um, but anyway, to, if you do want to try this method, first of all, you need one of these, these insulated containers. It's called a Dewar, D-E-W-A-R. Um, you can buy these online. Like um, this one is just a cheap Chinese one. Uh, like a crummy Chinese one I got online. It was pretty inexpensive. It's, it does the job, but it, I think it's kind of made of aluminum. Um, it, probably if I were to do this job again and I needed a nice one of these, I would probably have gone the route of trying to find like a nice uh, like lab-grade USA-made uh, stainless steel version of these. Um, and I kind of found uh, later that, you know, the best way to locate these used would be um, – kind of to cruise uh, marketplace or craigslist and what you want to search is doer d-e-w-a-r or like bowl semen because like farmers use these for like um uh keeping uh or for like their insemination and things so you might find a farmer who doesn't need theirs anymore um you know and you might find a better one than like these cheap ones but for my case this thing did the job it worked okay um and uh, I bought uh, a 10 liter, a 10 liter one. You can kind of see the size of it here. I wasn't exactly sure how much I needed for the job, uh, but in hindsight, 10 liters I, I believe was plenty. I think that I probably could have done, you know, this this bushing. I would say weighs maybe two pounds or so. I think with that 10 liter doer, uh, I would guess I could probably have done maybe four to six of these, maybe even 10 with that amount of liquid nitrogen. So. If you guys are buying these tanks, I guess 
that might be a rule of thumb. Um, I do have some left here. Um, uh, oh, I should probably back up. So um, to actually get the liquid nitrogen home, um, you need to find a place that sells it. And um, your best route here is going to be like your local welding shop, like a process gas or like an industrial um, process gas supplier. Um, in my area, that would be um, a company like Air Gas. In your area, it could be someone else. But that is kind of the type of place that's going to carry this stuff. And, um, you know, they won't sell it to you and just put it in any container. It has to be one of these liquid nitrogen rated containers. Um, you know, they're special. They, they are non-sealed. Um, they kind of just have this um, kind of vented mechanism here with, uh, you know, a styrofoam seal. And when you close a lid, it's, it's not airtight. It's meant to vent. You, you, can't, you can't let liquid nitrogen pressurize. Um, and also, um, you have to come and you have to go get it in a pickup truck uh, or a flatbed or some kind of a open air vehicle. You can't, you know, put this in a, a, a car or an SUV. It's got to be something that's open uh, for getting it home. Once you do get it home, uh, you've got to dump it in something to put the bushing in. So I just used uh, like one of these cheap uh, like beer coolers, like styrofoam beer coolers. Um, I also read that you could use uh, like a Pyrex container also works for liquid nitrogen. This, this I thought worked really good because as the bushing is cooling down, you can put the lid on and kind of keep the, the heat off the, the liquid. Um, so to show you guys what this looks like, um, I'll blow on it here. Um, that's what the liquid nitrogen looks like after you pour it in. It kind of bubbles lightly, um, just even being exposed to air. Um, and what I did was, um, for dropping the bushing into that, I just used a, like an extra long needle nose plier. You could use a snap ring plier. I didn't have one that opened up big enough to fit the ID. And uh, when you drop the bushing in to the liquid nitrogen, you, maybe you can hear it and see it. It really kind of boils pretty vigorously. Um, it'll kind of look like what you see here for maybe the first two minutes or so and then it'll start to calm down as the steel kind of normalizes with the cryogenic liquid there. Um, I would recommend you know dumping enough into your container to fully submerse the bushing. Um, like right here it's maybe a half inch or so below the level. Um, I think you want it totally submerged. Um, Put the lid on and let that cool down kind of while I finish the video here I'll, I'll come back to that so you guys can see what it looks like once it's cooled down I think when I when I attempted my first time I left it in there for about 10 minutes or so you can you can see the fog kind of coming out too of the lid it really goes crazy when you first put a warm object in but then it starts to calm down later as things normalize um, so, uh, like I mentioned before, guys, that did not work in my case, um, and I had to finish the job here using um, a hydraulic, uh, you know, hollow bore cylinder. So, I um, I borrowed this from a a, a friend who uh, graciously lended this to me, and I would not have been able to finish the job this weekend without this thing. And uh, it's basically a hand pump, like a 10,000 psi hand pump and cylinder. And what you do is, uh, I have one of my other bushings here. Um, you, um, you know, you start with the cylinder. The cylinder has a hole in it. Um, this is just a, a regular kind of high-grade threaded rod. This isn't really the right rod for this. You would want something maybe, you know, 20 or 30 ton rated, something beefier. This did work for me, though. And what you do is, um, you know, you ha use a big... Uh, heavy-duty washers or a plate. This is like a half-inch plate with some nuts on it. Um, you put the plate on top of the bushing. You th stick the rod through the cylinder, and uh, you know basically your you know your structure or like the rear frame of the backhoe or whatever joint you're doing would sit here. And as you um, extend the cylinder, you know this plate draws the bushing in. Um, in my case here, this 20-ton one was just barely enough to pull these bushings in. I felt like I was probably almost at 10,000 PSI before it was uh, moving. Like the first half halfway of the pull, it went pretty well, but then that last quarter inch or so barely went. Um, if I were you guys, depending on the size of your bushing, 
um, or the uh, the press force that you calculate, definitely get a cylinder that's at least um, maybe gives you five or ten tons on reserve of that that force that you calculate. So you're not right on the edge like I was. And what I actually had to do was when I was at full um, press, I was also hammering on the top of it with a pipe and um, like a three pound hammer to kind of give it a little extra. And every time I hit it, I could kind of feel the cylinder advance just a little more. So I had to kind of give it some help with this 20 ton. Um, I would say for like heavy equipment like backhoes or excavators, you'd at least want, you know, maybe uh, like a 40 or maybe even I saw the 60 tons are pretty common as well, just to make sure you're, um, you have some margin. So um, this did work pretty well. This is actually how I did finish the job. Um, um, like I said before, I kind of, I had calculated previously that I was going to have an interference fit. I thought I could muscle through it with the nitrogen, but it, it did not work. Um, so if you guys want a surefire solution, just go ahead and buy the hollow bore to start with. If you think that um, you've got a light enough press and you calculate a nice clearance fit with the the nitrogen, um, you know, go for it. It, it th at least this way, you're not you're not buying an expensive tool. You know, this is just a crummy uh, again uh, a Chinese one. But you know, if you were doing this frequently, you would want to get a nice U.S. made one like um, an OTC or an Interpack setup. Um, before I finish the video up, you guys are probably kind of curious to what this bushing looks like um, after it's been sitting in here for a while. So it's still it's still just a little bit below the level of the um, of of the liquid nitrogen yet. You can kind of see how it's just kind of a real light fizzle. Um, maybe after another five minutes or so, it'll calm down. Maybe just a little bit more. But this is almost um, kind of what it looked like when I pulled it out before I stuck it in the bore the first time when I kind of failed on my first install. Um, let me pull this out of here so you guys can kind of see what it does when you pull it out. You don't have a lot of time to work with this thing once you pull it out. Um, I would say, uh, you know, have all your tools at the ready. I had my hammer and my step plate adapter and everything right uh, within arm's reach. Um, you don't want to be messing around looking for tools when it's when it's game time and you're trying to push this cold thing in. Um, uh, but yeah, I guess that's uh, that's about it for this video. Um, I think I pretty much covered everything. I I hope I answered some of your guys' questions. Like I said, um, I found a few videos online with people using liquid nitrogen, but uh, not it, not in America, and um, maybe not this exact situation on like you know an excavator or a backhoe. So, um, thanks for watching, everyone, and uh, uh, happy wrenching. Uh, hey there, guys. Um, there were two items here I think I actually forgot to cover in my uh, my last video there and I wanted to make sure I included them um, you're probably also I had this question you're probably also wondering you know how do how am I going to handle this thing once I pull it out of the liquid nitrogen um, you know obviously you don't you don't want to you know put your hand in the liquid nitrogen you know you I use these long needle nose pliers to get it in and out but you know, once it's out and you've got to work with it and you've got to handle tools and things, um, you're asking yourself, you know, how am I going to handle this thing? How much insulation do I need to protect myself from this thing once it's out of the fluid? Um, at first, um, I had experimented with um, just heavy winter gloves with glove liners, but I kind of felt like um, they were just too restrictive. They didn't give me the dexterity that I needed to handle um, you know, my, my ada step plate adapter and a hammer and, you know, manipulate the bushing, you know, you've got very little time to work with this thing. Once you pull it out, you got to get it in, get it in place and slam it in the bore, um, as fast as you can. So, um, what I actually ended up doing, um, was using welding gloves. These are just, uh, Miller brand gloves with kind of a light insulation inside, um, leather, um, throughout the fingers. And I felt like, you know, once I had the thing out of the liquid and sitting on top of the bore, 
um, these gave me plenty of protection to just kind of handle handle the edges and work tools and things and kind of it gave me the flexibility and dexterity that I needed to kind of work um, work as how I needed to. Um, you guys also probably saw my hand in the first video there holding these pliers. I, um, you know, when you're actually working with this stuff, um, you know, you want to have, uh, you know, a face shield, uh, safety glasses, you know, heavy gloves, no exposed skin anywhere. I was just holding the camera there um, for that segment. But, um, yeah, just make sure you're, uh, you're fully clothed and protected um, in the event of any splash or anything. You know, as you're dropping that bushing into the the liquid nitrogen, um, you know, kind of set it in there. Don't don't drop it. Um, also, um, for when you when you do purchase the liquid nitrogen from the you know your process gas supplier like Air Gas or Praxair, wherever you end up getting it, um, you they'll charge you um, by the pound for it. And there's a conversion they use for um, pounds to liters. Um, in my case, for um, the 10 liter amount that I purchased for my doer, um, I believe it was around $40. Um, that's the current pricing anyway in my area. Um, the date is um, uh, November of 2023. So um, if you guys are kind of, you know, you're considering the, the liquid nitrogen route, if you think that your calculations are going to give you a slip fit like you need, um, you know you're gonna, you know you're probably gonna pay at least one to two hundred dollars for the doer, and then uh, you know a full fill from your process gas suppliers and the cost of you around another forty bucks. So um, hopefully, um, I think I had missed that in my first segment, guys. Um, I, I hope maybe that uh, this follow up here maybe answers the rest of uh, um, the things that you are curious about. So. Um, yeah, that is, now this is truly the end of the video. Um, I, uh, I, I hope this video was useful for someone, and uh, happy wrenching, everyone.